What I wanted to do today is talk a little bit about TMJ disorders, TMJ pain. There's a, a lot of words out there to describe TMJ therapy, uh, what it is, TMD, t- temporal mandibular disorder. Those of us that treat TMJ issues uh, always get a kick out of when people say, I have TMJ. Um, we always smirk and keep, say to ourselves, no, you have two. Um, all of us have what's called temporomandibular joints. We each have one on each side, a right and a left joint. So temporomandibular is just the description of, of the location of our of the joint itself. If there's something wrong with it, we call it temporomandibular disorder or TMJ pain, TMD, TM, etc. So uh, they're contrary to the popular belief or whatever it is out there marketing wise there is no such thing as a specialty in TMJ treatment TMJ therapy so i am a general dentist but i have advanced training in managing TMJ pain TMJ disorders and and things like that so i use a, most commonly a concept called neuromuscular dentistry to help with the TMJ disorders uh, but i don't have just one tool to treat i use other things as well when treating uh, the, the the jaw joints themselves And it's a chicken and the egg kind of a thing. Everything's interconnected. So if I treat one thing, uh, something else is affected. Quite often when we're doing smile makeovers, people want to improve their appearance. We want to make sure that it also doesn't create pain or that it lasts a long time. And so if we don't know how to manage the, the jaws and the bite forces, then things are just going to be temporary. A little bit about myself. I graduated from Oregon Health Sciences University in 1998. Uh, and quickly realize that uh, any dentist that graduates from dental school and doesn't continue with dental training beyond dental school is just an adequate dentist, uh, entry level, or working in um, in something where, where if the people that they're serving are just looking for a place to get their teeth cleaned and put out fires in an emergency setting, then a recent graduate is perfect for something like that. Uh, I realized I wanted to be able to offer more, so I joined many organizations. But membership in organizations isn't enough. Just That just means the check cleared to pay the dues to be a member of an organization. True uh, competence comes from actually taking courses within that organization, taking tests and improving your worth, and getting fellowships and certifications and, and, and things like that. So you will find when you visit me that we do have plaques throughout the office showing the certifications that I have achieved from a uh, diplomate in the American Board of Dental Sleep Medicine, uh, as an example, and things like that. So I have extensive training in, in a variety of things, and therefore my patients have uh, the benefit of being treated comprehensive. So when talking about the bite, there are a few things that uh, we need to make sure that we are aware of. And uh, proper and healthy function of a bite has, uh, is, there's a balance of, of a few things. There's the jaw joints. That's probably the primary thing that to consider. There's the jaw muscles that uh, are working, and the joints are where they pivot. And then it's just the teeth. The teeth themselves are what are are affected directly from the movement of the muscles of the jaws. So what we're trying to do when we are treating patients is we will look look for an intricate balance. If one thing, it's kind of like spokes in a wheel. If one goes off, one breaks, then the others are affected. They compensate and and are overworked. And eventually the other spokes in in a bike wheel are going to break down. The question is always, what causes an unbalanced bite? An unbalanced bite can come from unbalanced dental treatment. If you've ever had a filling and it wasn't quite adjusted, then that tooth is going to feel off. Or if you have a crown and it's just too tall, uh, sometimes you will just pound on that, that crown and that tooth will hurt. Or you can get what's called an avoidance interference. And your brain knows that that tooth is too tall, so it tells you as you try to chew to avoid that area. So it'll hit other teeth as a result of of one tooth. So the right side might be the problem, but the left side is what hurts. So that can be confusing to dentists included. Uh, Growing up, having breathing or allergy issues. You know, kids years ago always had their tonsils. At first sign of of inflammation, the tonsils and adenoids were removed. They're not doing that as often anymore, and we're seeing a lot of um, misaligned teeth because of the development that people are going through when things are... um, not handled properly. Thumb sucking as a, as a youth as well can also alter the architecture, the bite, uh, the 
arches of teeth. The upper arch should be horseshoe shaped and quite often ends up being a lot more of a narrow, an A-frame look to it. With a, a framed arch like that, the, um, the palate isn't developed the way that it should be. An, an undeveloped palate, a palate that did not descend. The roof of the mouth is the base of the nose. And so if the roof of the mouth is too tall, too vaulted, then the, roof of the, the nasal spine, then you can get a deviated sep septum uh, of the nose causing uh, airway issues. So it's all kind of a chain reaction of things. Old dentistry, that uh, every, everything in dentistry is designed, it's going to fail. And there's nothing that we do in dentistry that lasts forever. Certain things last longer than others. Things fail quicker. Some things fail a lot more quickly than others. But everything in dentistry will fail eventually. So old, worn-out dentistry sometimes doesn't just fail all at once. It, it breaks down over time. A little bit here, a little bit there. Things continue to break down. So you have a filling. And many times people will say, a filling fell out. And when they come into the office, we find that the filling didn't fall out, but their tooth broke, and, and part of the tooth structure is missing. So old dentistry can be a, a primary culprit. Shifting teeth after tooth loss. Uh, an example is a hockey player he has a, a fight on the ice, falls down and hits, or an elbow to the, the face, and, and, and a tooth gets knocked out. Well, if nothing is done to address the situation as time goes on, teeth are going to shift. And a shifting of teeth can affect the bite and cause problems that way. Sometimes just orthodontic work. Um, many orthodontists don't really have an occlusal philosophy or a bite preference, and they just want to make sure things look pretty. And for the most part, we, we can get away with that. Most humans are very adaptable, and the adaptive capability of people saves a lot of grief when the teeth are lined up. Um, sometimes just as long as they interdigitate and everybody's happy, then everybody's happy. But if there is some strain to the muscles, as time goes on, that re will reveal itself. So when we look at the jaw joint, there we always consider normal jaw movement. And as the jaws open and close, as the fossa, as the condyle, as the jaw bone descends down an eminence, or the, the bony socket, there is a disc that's in there that helps cushion and brace the jaw bone for stability. And at maximum opening, it's going to be compressed and bracing the jaw joints. What can happen in abnormal jaw movement is sometimes the jaws habitually are in a different position than ideal, and so the disc is already displaced or in, a, in, an, in an area that it really shouldn't be. And so as the jaws start to open and close, we can sometimes get noises. We can get a click as it opens. We can get a click as it closes. So we either we have a call it an early click or a late click. Uh, sometimes it captures and re recaptures. Other times it doesn't. So for those that just don't know that that those are just words that mean things to other dentists, but to the patient they just know that it clicks. Sometimes we get other things called crepitus. And that's um, it, where it sounds like cellophane being crinkled up. Uh, you hear every time you're chewing food, it sounds like cellophane is being crumpled up or uh, fire in a in a fireplace. Um, that's called crepitus. That's a sign that there's some some trauma to the disc itself. And as time goes on, if the muscles are straining the jaw joint, the bone actually can deform, and and we call it beaking of the condyle. The 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 condyle or the jaw joint jaw bone can curve. And so it's important for us to know if that's already happened or not. So the teeth should really come together kind of like gears in a, a wheel, like in the watch. They look like little wheels inside your watch, and as they rotate, they, they come together. The teeth of the wheel come together and meet. Our, our teeth should do something very similar, and if they don't fit perfectly, then the things can, can compensate. And we can get things like headaches, we can get neck aches, we can get pain in the jaw joint itself, but to be honest, most of the time the pain that people report is not in the jaw joints. Most of the pain they report and point to are uh, other areas, like the headaches and the, the, the forehead or the neck, or sometimes they'll say they'll have ear problems, ringing in the ear, or more commonly a fullness to the ear. They call it swimmer's ear. So it just feels like there's a bunch of water in your ear. If you shake your head real violently, then maybe the water will drain, but there's no water there, so you can, if you shake your head, you just look like you're crazy. Tooth wear and clenching is a sign that there's an imbalance to the bite. And then changes in posture. As the muscles compensate, you, people will often change their, their posture trying to make up for it. So symptoms 
I have a list of symptoms on my website talking about the different things that can happen with there's a temporomandibular disorder. The thing about the list, though, is you don't have to have every single item on the list in order to qualify as someone with a problem. In fact, sometimes people will report very few, if any, of the things on the list. But the things we're going to include, TMJ pain, limited opening, dizziness, equilibrium kind of an issue when you've got ear problems, ear aches or congestion, Bell's palsy, trigeminal neuralgia. You can have back pain, gum recession, neck pain, pain behind the eyes, most commonly described as a, as a, a sharp dagger right behind the eyeballs. So that can be a sign that there's a TMJ issue. So we can have war, a war between muscles and teeth. And there's three things that will end up happening. Number one, if, if the muscles win, there's usually very little pain, but we have a lot of worn down dentition. Our teeth are flat. They're a lot shorter than they used to be. So usually it's an aesthetic issue when people come to me saying that they want to improve the way they look. That's really an, usually an undiagnosed TMJ problem. If the teeth win, the teeth look pretty, but these are the people that are in, in chronic pain. They have headaches. They touch a certain trigger point in the, in the muscles. Those are the, the people that can be a little bit more, more of a challenge because we have the, all the pain to manage first. And probably most commonly or worse is it's a combination. Teeth started to wear, they got fixed. As the teeth got repaired and they were repaired with very durable materials, they no longer gave out, but now the muscles have to pay the price and compensate. So sometimes we can have a perfect smile, but not a perfect bite. And so just having a beautiful smile doesn't mean that everything is okay. Now, the posture is probably a, a very common misunderstood situation. If there's tension in the muscles, many people are going to try to alleviate that tension. They'll, they'll alter their position uh, to, to make things better. It's kind of like if you had a, a pebble in your shoe, you're going to change the, your gait or you're going to change the way that you walk trying to avoid that pebble in your shoe. But eventually, as you alter your your walking, your hips are going to compensate. And as your hips try to compensate, your shoulders are going to balance your, yourself out. And eventually, you're going to walk looking like a corkscrew. So your postural disorders are things to, to, to consider. And many times what we'll do when we take photographs uh, of people, we, we use a grid to photograph in front of it just to look for asymmetry. And many times we will find people had no idea that their one shoulder was higher than another. So really, it all comes down to what is it that we do? That's what everyone wants to know. What are we going to do? So we use modern science. We use modern instruments to figure out what's causing the TMJ problem, what is the damage that's already happened, and then what is it that we can do to help it or correct it. And so the treatment is always kind of a mystery until we get going. So we start off with an, an evaluation, an observation, an examination. So if you were to come into my office for just a consultation, if I don't do an examination, I can't tell you what the problem is. I can't tell you what I can do to help because uh, I don't know what the problem to fix. So we need to do an uh, examination. And with that examination, we need to take x-rays. And not just x-rays of the teeth, but including x-rays of the teeth, but also x-rays of the jaw joint themselves. We, we need to know what the anatomy that we're working with. Have, has there been irreversible bone changes? Because we may be a management case and not a cure case. Then we want to take detailed casts or detailed impressions of your teeth and make stone models so we can really see what's what's happening and what, what we can work with. At that point, we're going to need to do what's called K7 instrumentation. We use a sophisticated computer to evaluate the muscles and the, the movement of your bite. So there's a series of tests that we do, and it takes a few hours to comprehensively evaluate the bite. We use a magnet to track the jaw movement the trajectory, deviations. We use sonography to listen to the jaw joint for uh, noises, listen for damages. We're, use, we're going to use myography to look at the muscle activity at rest, and we're going to use TENS to get the muscles to, to rest. TENS stands for transcutaneous electrical neurostimulation. Just a very long way of saying that we're going to use electricity to get the muscles to, to get balanced and relaxed. At that point, we can evaluate the bite position. So w many times people have come to me from an office where they took, they made a night guard, and that night guard was simply impressions of their teeth and then an impression of their bite, and they bit down all the way until their teeth met. That's actually, all that's doing is, is reproducing a pathological accommodative position, which just means we have repeated a bad bite. It's pathologic. It's not good. That's, that's why you have pain. It's accommodative. You've gotten used to it. And we've reproduced this bad bite, so we shouldn't really expect anything better. 
we need to find a better bite. So what we do is we find from the tens and from the evaluation the better position to make the bite. And with, the, that if, with this new position, we can then re send this information to the lab and have an orthotic fabricated. Now, we can do an orthotic in two different ways. Now, if number one, the orthotic goes, we call it an orthotic and not a night guard because it's repositioning the bite. We're not just giving you something else to chew on. We're actually changing the position of the bite so that the muscles are more balanced and the headaches and things can go away. This orthotic goes on the lower arch and it can be either removable or we can make an orthotic that is bonded to the teeth. Now, we only want to bond to the teeth if we plan to do something afterwards, you know, phase two. If we don't know what, if we're, we're going to go past phase one, then we really don't want anything permanent because if we bond it in place, we are permanently committing to this new position. With removable, we're not quite so committed. So we call this orthotic phase, phase one, we diagnostic and therapeutic. Diagnostic meaning we're going to learn a lot about you, where your bite is, how it's affecting you, and therapeutic. It should feel better. If we can't help in the orthotic phase, then there isn't anything else I can do in any other phase. But if we have, the, in the orthotic phase, a pain-free position, and I, I like to go for three months minimum of pain-free before we move forward to, to more treatment, to phase two. Now, what is phase two? Well, it depends on what we learn on phase one. If phase one, it was, we've, we learned that very, very little, the bite was actually pretty close to, to perfect, just need a little bite adjustment, then I, we do an equilibrium. We adjust the bite, and then, uh, then you're good. Maybe long-term orthotic wear. Now, the, the phase one orthotic is going to be made out of acrylic. It's not going to be very durable, so over time, that's going to break down and wear out. If we're going to commit to a long-term orthotic wear, then we may want to reproduce that position out of a material that's going to be a lot more durable. So that's going to be a much bigger investment than just plastic. Sometimes it's going to be orthodontics. We can move and reposition the teeth into this balanced bite, but that's a lot more involved and complicated than just normal orthodontics where we're just trying to make teeth straight and pretty. So there's a commitment of time involved there as well. Or it's going to be restorations. We're either going to uh, if it's just a couple millimeters of, of off, many times we can, if the teeth have been worn down and they're half as tall as they used to be, then let's make them look the way they should. And when we make them look pretty, we can balance the bite. Sometimes that means an entire arch of restorations, meaning your entire upper teeth are all crowned and veneered. Or sometimes it's all your teeth, upper and lower. And we don't really know until we get in uh, into the case in, during phase one. But Quite often, we get two for one. A balanced bite can also have what we call a non-surgical facelift. We get a result that looks very, very... Many people look younger uh, just by having their bite in a better position. So we call that a non-surgical facelift, but we try to be very clear that we're not doing any type of facelift. I have some plastic surgery friends that don't like me advertising facelift, and I try to be clear. I'm not really doing a facelift. It just has a similar effect. So when we get the teeth... In, with neuromuscular dentistry, uh, when we get everything balanced and, and the patient is happy and comfortable, then we know that, uh, that the dentistry that we perform will last a very, very long time. Now, occasionally what we do, maybe even as a, during phase one or somewhere along the line, we may want to incorporate use of uh, Botox. We call it therapeutic Botox application. And sometimes if it's, there's just a few muscles that just need to break the cycle of pain, we can inject those muscles with a neurotoxin. It's really a purified protein from the toxin, and that will give uh, relief of pain. We had one person, they'd been two years, they had a, a child, and, and she had uh, headaches ever since delivery, and the pain, the headaches had never gone away. And so we used quite a bit of Botox, probably an entire vial was used, and the headaches went away. And wouldn't you know it, the headaches never came back. So Botox may have some short-term short -term benefit, and we do have some people that come on a regular basis to, to continually uh, relieve the muscle pain that happens from a, a, a bad bite. So if you have a TMJ disorder or you have headaches that you want evaluated, feel free to give us a call, 206-241-5533.